we find trends that haven't been kind of capitalized in certain markets or in certain marketing channels. And then we also obviously add our flair to it. Hey, Founder Fam, welcome back to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today we're speaking with one of the best e commerce minds in the country, Davey Fogarty. Every 10 seconds, the Davey Group sells a product across the globe with lines in clothing, health and wellness, beauty, and pet care. And perhaps most famously, Davey's brand, The Udi, is generating hundreds of millions of dollars every single year. Today, we're gonna go deep on all things e-commerce, what it takes to build an incredible brand in 2022. I hope you enjoy this in-person conversation in our studio. Please welcome Davey Fogarty. I'm really excited to speak with you, man, because um, I've watched your story from afar for the past year since you've kind of really put yourself out there. I'd heard of you through our mutual friend Greta for many years of you killing it behind the scenes. So um, the first question I ask everyone is, how did you get your job, AKA, how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? You know, it's funny, I was, I was telling you before that you're actually the first podcast that I listened to. And when I heard and you were asking it back then, it would have been four or five years ago or something like that. And I remembered that I just did not have a good answer for that question, <laughs> and I still don't think I do. Um, my job is, is interesting. It's obviously progressed like most people. Um, it started, uh, you know, standard school, um, graduated school, and then I went into university. Everyone was telling me, get into university, get that piece of paper, it's, it's required. And then I um, got into growth hacking Instagrams, which is how I met Greta. She's the Instagram queen. Um, and I was growing Instagrams, 600,000 followers or something like that. Um, that was really kind of at the same time as the mining engineering. So I had a bit of a decision to make what to kind of pursue. I realized that I really liked entrepreneurship. So I did what every normal person does and I started a Vietnamese roll shop. Uh, so I basically dropped out of, I dropped out of university to start a Vietnamese roll shop all while doing the Instagrams. Honestly, I don't know why Vietnamese rolls, aside from the fact that I really liked eating them, um, which is probably not the main requirement of starting a business. But yeah, started that. That went downhill really quickly. Instagram kept doing really, really well. Um, started selling the Instagram, selling advertising as people still do to this day. And then, yeah, basically um, re launched a couple of e-commerce businesses as well. So, you know, that was obviously fueling a lot of my failures. I've had a lot of them. Um, the, it, I, and then I launched e-commerce. I tried to do seasoning. So when I, I was basically in my shed, grinding up seasonings, trying to sell them through these Instagrams. And I realized that I was doing a lot of like hacky permissionless stuff and I, I really didn't have any idea how to connect with the audiences because these impressions on Instagram are very, you know, low connection, low relevance if you don't know what you're doing. And that's pretty much what I had at that point is really kind of unengaged um, followers. So it didn't really work. Ended up, yeah, moving to Melbourne um, and just to keep learning this stuff, learned a ton from Greta, a ton from yourself and a lot of other people as well. And then ended up launching, you know, I was actually started videography. And I think that that was really a massive turning point because it helped me create video ads and connect and learn how to tell a story, how to pace things, how to work with the platform algorithms. And then, yeah, ended up, using that videography, all those skills that I learned along the way to launch Calming Blankets, which was my first e-commerce brand. And yeah, that was kind of like, I was actually just like on the tipping point of quitting, you know, yes. as, as this, um, I probably wouldn't have to be completely honest, but it really felt like that. It almost felt like I was really at, hap I was really at peace and happy with videography because, uh, you know, I could travel, like it was doing something that I really enjoyed. And I kind of left this ambition kind of just be like, look, if this is what my life is, it's fine. I'm, my, I'm just not cut out for entrepreneurship. Yes. And I just said, look, one more go. And then that's when I launched Calming Blankets and I brought that in and it did really well. It really, it was just pr right product, right time. Um, definitely my ability to communicate and market at that point was, was way, way better. So it grew really, really quickly. I'm not sure what revenue we did first year, but 
would have been over over a million dollars in its first year, which was great. Um, and then from there, I launched Udi pretty much at the same time. Yes. And Udi is now our biggest brand that that grew very very quickly. And since then, I've just launched a, a lot of other products. Yeah. Wow. So, love to fast uh, before we fast forward. I'd love to kind of just go back. So you started the Vietnamese roll company, local business in Adelaide? Yeah. And where'd you come up with that idea and when was that? Like how long ago was that? Okay, you're testing my memory. I think it would have been, it would have been five years ago. So you pretty okay. much straight out of school. Yep. Yeah. Straight out of school, well, 18? One or two years out of school. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So 20, yep. okay. And then... At what point did you realize? So you you got a you know you got a store location front. You set up branding. You hired staff. You like, assume I set up branding. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you hired staff. Like how much did it cost to fund that? Where did you get the money to kind of fund that? For sure, it was all through Instagram. So I've I was sold um, one of my Instagrams for over thirty thousand dollars, and I, I did that. You know. A multiple over ten thousand dollars, kind of at that age, yes. of selling them. There was other people um, that had, you know, that was probably a failure on my part as well, considering the past that my colleagues that were also growing Instagrams at the time yes. built businesses. Greta is one of them, yeah. built, building million dollar businesses. You know, I I was just constantly doubting what I was actually building. I didn't have the foresight to, or people around me to kind of communicate. This is a legitimate business. Mm. Um, you know, one of my mentors is is 100%. My dad, he's always helped me with business and and I don't think he understood it. Yes. Um, obviously, incredible other things in with his business and whatnot. But yeah, it was entirely self-funded at that point. Got you. And how long did it take for the Vietnamese role uh, business uh, for you to kind of go, you know what, this isn't working, this isn't for me? What was the tipping point there? Yeah, that was... Um, I'd love to say that, that was, you know, I thought I needed to give it a crack. Uh, I, I don't like giving up. It's against my nature, but the lease was two years. I gave it two years. I think I actually exited six months early yes. um, from that. So uh, and just kind of sold it. I didn't make any money from it. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I was, because obviously when you don't have a successful business like that, you need to be the employee in it. You're constantly working. So I was doing 12 hours days just cooking Vietnamese rolls in my lunch break, flipping Instagrams and whatnot, doing what I probably should have been doing the whole time. So um, yeah, it was brutal. It was a big year and a half um, sprint. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so when did you start the seasoning and get into e-commerce? When did that, so that was about four years ago, three years ago? So I think that overlapped when I moved to Melbourne. Yeah. So um, I stopped that. In fact, yeah, I stopped that and then came over to Melbourne, was doing the seasoning while that was happening, wasn't working. Um, I think that was about a year stint. And then I came back to Adelaide. Um, and then, yeah, that takes us to 23, 24 years old. Um, and that's when I started Udi. Yeah, got you. So you've only been doing Udi for about, or and coming back for about three, four years. In some, yeah, like, yeah, I've done, only been truly in e-commerce for about four years. Yeah, wow, that's impressive. So where does this entrepreneurial spirit come from? I think it's a good question. I think there's a, you know, it's not a simple answer. I've been very fortunate in my upbringing. Um, I'm very, you know, cognizant of that. Um, I always had security in my house. My parents were um, business owners themselves. Their business doesn't exist anymore. It was just a local furniture shop, but they've always encouraged me to take risks. So I think that's kind of the the one of the main reasons. It's just always been part of my upbringing. Another one is just you know in year ten I was like asked to pretty much leave school. I was you know going nowhere, getting in trouble a lot. Um, people were just uh, very aware that I was um, yeah doing the wrong thing on a lot of occasions. And then, um, yeah, basically I had two teachers that kind of saw past that and saw that I did have ability, my physics and my English teacher, and they basically just um, sat me down and, and really gave me the, the attention that I needed to believe in myself. And then, uh, you know, so long story short, I think that the doubters in those situations really made me want to do what I can do and then also make, you know, my parents proud as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, so you could say that you had a bit of a chip on your shoulder, something to prove? Definitely. 
Definitely. I, and I, I think, I think, I think that is one of the strongest <laughs> motivators, you know, yeah. and I don't think it's the most healthy motivator. And I think if you're lucky, you let that evolve into something that's more internal rather than external. So more so really wanting to prove it to yourself and, you know, just enjoying the process rather than proving those other people. Cause I think um, I've already done that <laughs> in some, some regards. Mm. So what were the biggest lessons that you got from the early ventures with the Vietnamese roll company, the seasoning business? It sounds like you probably had some other e-commerce businesses, even from flipping Instagram accounts back in the day. What could you share um, was been great lessons? Yeah, there's obviously been a lot. I think the first one is um, learn who you are as a person. You know, the So me, if you kind of break that down, what that looks like is I just jump in and I just do stuff. And that causes me issues to this day. You know, I'll just buy this business or do this. It's just like, it's it's a very action orientated mindset. Action creates um, information. Like that is okay. Um, if you kind of have the foundational knowledge to make sure that that action isn't gonna be extremely detrimental. So the, the Vietnamese role business is a good example of that. So getting the baseline knowledge is really, really important, especially when you're a young entrepreneur um, to before you start doing those ventures. But at the same time, don't be the, on the other side where you're just constantly learning and you're not doing anything because you're just not gonna get that information um, that you really, really do need. So you might fail a couple of times. Don't be afraid of that. The second, probably more practical one um, that you can also distill from those stories is the... Um, is, is, is product is everything. You know, if I had calming blankets, even in that situation, that product, I probably would have succeeded. Um, so it is really about having that right product and that right knowledge about how to get that product out there in the early stages. Yeah, and you do some really cool stuff with product, testing products. I want to talk through all of that because um, it sounds like that's been a key successful ingredient to the ventures or any of the brands that have, you've, you've had in your portfolio that really take off. Um, I'm curious though, just this one is, uh, one thing I've noticed about you is you, 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 you can do media buying, mm -hmm. you can do videography, mm -hmm. you can do social media, you can write direct response copy, mm -hmm. you can start things. Like you, you are a real jack of all trades. Where does that come from? Because that is not unique. Right. Usually you, you either got a marketing or a product guy, you've got someone that's quite operational. Like, yeah, like, yeah. How, did, how do you force yourself to kind of work all these things out? And where do you find that time? Because that's really impressive. Do you think that that is unique about you or do you not? Or I don't think that's unique about me. I think it's a relatively rare experience. And that experience is a privilege of being a single founder. You know, you kind of forced to do that. If you're a bootstrapped founder, not hiring people straight from the get-go, you're forced to learn all of those things to make it work. Mm. I think if you go the above layer of those things that you just mentioned that I'm good at, I'd like to say that my team now are much, much better than me. That If I'm in the ad account, I probably will stuff it up if I tried to touch it nowadays. But in the early stages, yeah, I was doing all of that. I think extract parts of the media buying, which is the more um, pattern recognition element of it, you've got, you're a creative. So the videography, the copywriting, you're just a general marketer in all of those senses. And that really um, became apparent about how bad I was at operations and finance. So there definitely is the strengths. I'm not kind of an anomaly where I can do it all, um, but my mar marketing is definitely my strength. Creative is definitely my strength. The other stuff has been much slower to learn, um, so yeah. Do you think that these skills are required in, you know, if you want to launch an e-commerce business tomorrow um, to have an unfair advantage? Yeah, I think there's obviously a lot of ways to launch a business. To do a bootstrapped e-commerce product and follow the path that I did, you 100% need to understand the marketing. You can't forecast your way out of that business. You can't be super good at ops. Um, you need that marketing person and generally you don't have heaps to spend on it. And as you know, marketers are actually quite hard to get. Um, so I think, you know, unless your co-founder is a marketer um, or something like that, you're gonna struggle to get that cash coming in to fuel your growth. That being said, 
if you are you know raising capital or you do have a best friend that's a gun at Facebook ads, then that that can make it work as well because you are going to need that polarizing skill set um, with ops and on finance as well. And is there a reason you don't have a co-founder or co-founders, or you do actually? Yeah, you do some stuff with Greta. Yeah, so you have a few co-founders, with a few brands, right? Yeah. So the Davy Group, like Woody, Calming Blankets, that's all one hundred percent me, and yeah. that was you know probably not really by design. Like I see value in having a co-founder. It's just I I, I didn't launch it that way. Um, obviously, grew quite well. So. Um, it worked out really well, but you know, I'm not not against working with people. That's for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about the Udi, how that concept came about, how you came up with that idea. I know you have a unique process when it comes to finding product ideas. You have the Davy Group, which is kind of like uh, a Thrasio, Thrasio Amazon brand. You're trying to build like a PNG kind mm. of Procter and Gamble. Is that the play there? And you're just always testing different brands. Is that? Yeah. I think the the play there is probably a bigger topic. Um, like how I find products, I'm generally looking for trends globally. That's how um, Calming Blankets and, and all my products have kind of come about. We find trends that haven't been kind of capitalized in certain markets or in certain marketing channels. Yes. And then we also obviously add our flair to it. You know, we dif- you need to differentiate your product, otherwise it's just gonna, your margin's going to get eaten away and um, you know, it's just obviously better to progress businesses like that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how we find our products. We make sure that there's a strong contribution margin. We, we make sure that we can build, like, yeah, a really good value around the product. Udi, we do a ton of licensing. We make it's like the highest quality possible fabric that you can get. So um, that's that's pretty much our requirement. I'm actually building. I I have big workflows and I'm building tools around how to find products as well. Yeah, and right now across Davy Group, how many products are you testing? How does that all work in that machine? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Since last podcast I've done, probably my answer's going to change a little bit here. So iOS caused a huge issue, the privacy updates that have made tracking in Facebook very, very difficult. My also knowledge around the longevity of these products has also changed. So, you know, we used to test hundreds of products a year. Um, what that looked like is getting, you know, sample three to five units, bringing it in, understanding the CPAs that we could get, shooting it as if we had a million of the products, yep, um, and then understanding the CPA because the cost per acquisition is the variable cost that you don't understand. It's it's hidden in the ether until you to bring it to light. So the the reason why that that, that was quite flawed in some ways is. You don't actually understand how far that's going to scale as well. You can get that initial CPAs and over time you get a touch and a feel for it. You'll get 15 return on ad spend as soon as you launch it and you're like, okay, this is yeah. this is an Audi style product. Um, and then some products you'll bring in, I'm not sure if you've had this experience, you probably have, all entrepreneurs have, you're so excited about the product. You've done all everything right, all the market research, you spend so much money on it, so much time, and it just doesn't even convert. You don't even get one sale. So they're the, that, that validation process that I just mentioned is great for finding those polarities. Mm. Um, and I still see a lot of value in, in doing it if that's the question you're trying to answer. I think over time I realized that, you know, what is going to move the needle for us as a business that's, you know, doing over 150 million revenue a year, we need to go after something a bit heavier and like time is also a bit of a problem for us. Resources is a problem. So we still look at it like this is going to be a validation we'll commit a little bit harder but we'll also consider the longevity of the product how does this fit into our brand narrative and stuff like that as well got you so when it comes to davy group how many brands do you have right now good good question we have about five major brands um yeah so there's coming blanket still the Udi, what are the others? Are you able to share? Pupnaps, yep. uh, Udi, Outdoor Play, and then the other one I can't can't share just yeah. yet. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Outdoor Play is a US-based business that was an act- actually an acquisition, Yep. Um, which is an interesting business. You know, you mentioned Thrasio before. They're an incredible roll-up company. Um, a lot, there's a lot of aggregators out there at the moment focusing on Amazon, which makes sense. Um, the business model of, Am- of Amazon aggregators you know, they're obviously going to be struggling with the current financial 
climate, you know, the supply chain crisis, then also multiples now coming down. That was the whole play, multiple arbitrage. So there's lots of complexities with that, but it, in its, its foundation really does make sense in that the optimizations that they can make on one Amazon listing may be able to be transferred to the next. Mm. Um, and the tech stack is much simpler. The Shopify aggregators, which I don't consider us as one just yet, I'd probably say wanna be Procter & Gamble's as you kind of phrased it. Um, there is complications around the tech stack and stuff like that that you need to consider. Like what? So for example, different 3PLs, um, different uh, front ends, so Shopify, Magento, BigCommerce, like you can't just apply a base theme across things. The way you split test things are gonna be different, workflows, all of those kind of things. Even acquisition methods is big. So, um, and you know, these are all hindsight things. I probably didn't think about these before the acquisition as, as much as I should have. Um, but you know, the acquisition methods, you know, one business is heavily reliant on say Google versus, you know, Facebook acquisition, which is more about Udi side of things. So yes. even your team um, resources need to be different and your knowledge gaps need to be filled. Got you. So are you kind of realizing that if you slowed down on testing new products, launching new products, launching new brands, you'll still do it, but perhaps there's a more focused play on on the ones that are really working and doubling down? Is that Definitely. I think that's my main um, main takeaway and uh, from last year is, you know, we really need to focus on our main levers. The UDI could be far bigger than it was. It was sold out 50% of last year. Um, so now we just need to focus on our kind of main levers. And since we've done that, you know, UDI's just skyrocketed. So, you know, we restructured teams and whatnot to allow um, single focus on brands, not yes. getting heaps spread across, which is a massive, massive lesson. Also, obviously, capital is an incredibly important thing. We shouldn't be applying heaps of capital to products for a brand with, you know, 1 million customers when we could do it with two, for example, uh, with 2 million customers. So yeah, some big lessons in that for sure. Got you. So coming back to the Udi, how fast did it take for you to get traction? Like how, like you said you tested, did you test the other products and you just saw nothing like with Udi? Like what's special? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think where we feel very well, I know I certainly do feel very lucky around the products that I hit. Granted, I failed a lot of times. I've already been into that. But the, the, those products, my first three products skyrocketed. You know, they did minimum a million dollars in their first year. Um, you know, I think Udi did two, then 20, then, you know, 200 or something like that. It, was, it, it just went really, really quick. And this is where the whole business model of testing and validating and finding those products um, came in play because I was like, okay, I've hit these three. Everything is easy. You know, I'm okay media buyer. I'm okay at this. I'm okay at that. And it's still taking off and we're, over, we're surpassing other businesses. So it really is that core foundational product. But as I said before, and this is why I'm developing tools and processes now for a data orientated approach before we even validate to really tick all these boxes and pick these right products um, so that when we launch them, you know, we, you know, just trying to find the, the answer before we even bring it out, if that makes sense. So I'd love to delve a little deeper on that. Like, what does that look like? You said, you know, like you, you're setting up tools and processes to, to work out from a data-driven approach, mm -hmm. not just from a paid acquisition, you're getting these CPAs. What, what yeah. other things? It's a good question. I don't want to plug my products okay, too badly. Okay. Oh, so SaaS, so you build it, I build a SaaS, yeah. yeah. I don't want to use yeah. your platform yeah. to yeah. plug my products. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, um, yeah we, I started a tool called Trend Rocket. Yep. And basically what it does is it scrapes all of these data points. So Facebook, Trustpilot reviews, Instagram. Yep. Um, it looks at ad libraries. It looks at, it even goes to Alibaba, contacts suppliers for their feature products yep. that exist out there, understands the cost of goods. What that looks like in the end is you're getting a large data pool of how and how well this product is growing in a certain region, what tools they're using to grow it, um, and then also where that trend is not currently leveraged. Because oh, that, yeah. that, that ad inventory is so important to CPMs. I think it's one thing that's kind of not understood well enough um, is how competition affects your ads. And not and more because obviously it's a um, relatability question. So if there's ten weighted blanket um, 
people advertising in Australia, they're all going to, and someone shows interest in that, that's, we're all going to be competing. So if there's no advertiser, what then happens to your CPMs? And that's really, aside from the products, aside from, you know, the, how good calming blankets and woody were for our customers, I think that that's one of the main reasons they grew so quick is because there was very little competition in those regions for, mm. for similar trends. So what I'm hearing is effectively what you're trying to do is productize your process yeah. of finding brands to use software to scale that out. Exactly. I've had so many people ask me how I've done that. Um, so I've just you know gone gone and reverse engineered it because um, we've launched so many. You know, I'm yes. learnt using the lessons of those failed validated products as well. I'm like, why didn't this work? So yeah, just trying to reverse engineer that and put in a SaaS so other um, people can learn it. But if you were selling it, wouldn't wouldn't it make it difficult to have the uniqueness? Like, wouldn't that be an unfair advantage for mm -hmm. your group? Look, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's an interesting dilemma, and I'll cross it for that to become a problem both for my group and the existing customers on the platform. You know, there's going to be a million brands on this on this thing. Yes. What I'm, what I do believe is there's not. There's not, you know, a million opportunities to launch an e-commerce business at all times. There might be one in each niche each year. These success stories um, that you see. So, but my theory is that if I can get it to a point where that becomes a problem, it's going to be a big tool, and it's already helped a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay, interesting. So, little similar to like Jungle Scout, right? Like Jungle Scout, you go on Amazon, you can see volume, you can see opportunity, or all sorts of things, right? Exact, that, exactly yeah. right. As I mentioned before, the tech stack becomes more difficult because there's there's multiple um, things at play and people are using different review platforms and stuff like this on their Shopify store. So it's like, yes, it's like Jungle Scout, but more complicated because there's a lot more other tech involved. Gotcha. So anybody watching this right now, is looking to launch a brand, like what's the most common mistake you see new brands making? Oh, I think just crap marketing. Like you just, you, I think, you know, I, I put it in different buckets and I think that's important to do as well. So you're a brand new founder and you're trying to launch a product. You go to the Shopify website, there's nothing in the footer. It's like the copy is really, really bad. They're using stock images. They're like they don't understand what cost that customer actually wants. You know, they're not they don't have clear product images. It's just like all of these things that install trust, which I'd like to say is just crappy marketing. The other brands, yeah, I would, like when you're trying to get when you maybe found that successful product and you've got like a bit of a better website and stuff like that. That's when it probably more comes down to the 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 feedback loops that they are then creating within their business to scale it, which, you know, maybe it's a technical problem. Maybe they're structuring their ad accounts poorly. Maybe they're just not producing enough content on Facebook. It's kind of those things that they need to just keep repeating. Um, but it's that, that's the common question that I get when the first new entrepreneur and they just haven't taken enough time to go look at 50 brands and just look at how they've structured their website and kind of copied those elements to build trust. Got you. Um, so do you have like a template around a Shopify and like a CRO, like, cause you would have done so many split tests where you're like, we know if we do this, we know if we do this. Like I, I follow guys on Twitter where they're mm. like, uh, there was a guy, this Carl, I forget his yeah, last name. Carl, yeah, 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 he did, he did recommendation for my fiance's website, Healthish, right. and then he did one for yours. Or, yeah. and, and like it looked like he had a sort of a blueprint. Do you have a blueprint of things to do? Yeah. Can you share some of that? Yeah, Carl's, Carl's fantastic. So I think, I think that that element is maybe a step further, which is probably those brands that are already successful, which is, yeah, you need that framework to start split testing. And you hit the nail on the head going to Twitter and following people like Carl and a lot of other people as well that are publishing these best practices and then just going and implementing them. That's a great way to do it. I think um, for the new entrepreneur, you, I would do that as well, but you just need to go to an established website. Like the, the traditional, the big guys are kind of setting the ideal format for a website that you then just need to copy. You can even go to like, Woody, granted we've got actually a lot of things that we need to fix on that, but you could go to like an ASOS or an Iconic and really look, how have they structured their footers? 
okay, I'm gonna do that. How do they structure their descriptions in their products? And just kind of look at that and, and really dissect, how do I build more trust? Got you. So um, when it comes to kind of, I guess, all the different brands, you talked about product being a, a common denominator. Is there anything else that you could share with our audience around the repeatability of, of the framework that you're using across the group that you think is key when it comes to starting successful brands? Because you have an incredible track record, to be honest, man, and the, the speed in which you've grown um, the Audi Calming Blankets, all these other brands, it's, it's seriously impressive. So I'm just trying to kind of decode that a bit more. Yeah, look, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think the main thing is you're trying to find a product that scales through a very scalable paid digital format. And if you just break that down, that might be TikTok organic. So really testing a product or an idea on the paid format of your choice, getting initial traction, and then just doubling down on that and building processes to just keep repeating it. It's, um, that's the main thing. So you talk about paid a lot and as mm -hmm. uh, a strong way to kind of test different products. You talked about data privacy, iOS 14, um, and the performance of paid advertising. No business has been immune to that. Like for us at Founder, you know, we've, 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 we've been hit, all business has been hit. Many businesses unfortunately have shut down um, because they've been so reliant on paid advertising. It still works. Like, you know, we still, still spend a lot of money on Facebook ads and, and in all sorts of paid traffic channels. I, like, what's your take there? What's the lessons been for you? Are you still spending a ton of money on Facebook ads, uh, TikTok ads? Like, what's your take? I'd love to hear where things are at for you there. Yeah, everyone's been here. I think our larger businesses, our smaller businesses have been disproportionately hit. Mm. Um, I don't have a strong theory behind why that's the case, um, even when we're looking at percentages changes. I think um, maybe there's just less data to work that Facebook can have even more. Um, you know, Udi's got a lot of data that's flowing through it. Um, it's incredibly tough, and I think that this is where a lot of businesses that have poor products are going to, to really struggle as well. I think one of my main lessons, which wasn't really, it was, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. When people ask you, are you diversified from an acquisition channel? You're like, yeah, I'm advertising on TikTok. And it's just like, I think that the, to have the level of thinking to understand that there's actually a platform issue and reliance on Apple iPhones was would have just been incredible. So, you know, we can say that we're diversified through Instagram and Facebook, so Instagram influencers and Facebook, but it's all flowing and so reliant on that single element. And I think that that's going to continue to get worse. We've got the Android privacy update coming, I think, next month. Um, I do think that that's going to be a lesser extent um, because a lot of our uh, you know, everyone probably in this room already has an iPhone, so um, not too many people are getting served ads on Android, especially within Australia. So lesser extent there. I think, um, yeah, it's there are attribution tools out there, to name a few. We've got the Triple Whale Pixels just came out, but um, a more probably robust, in my experience, tool is Northbeam, um, which is, I think these tools, um, there's, there's a couple of others out there, so do your own research. I think these tools are great to remove um, multi-touch attribution and really understand if a platform's working. So really strong example is um, in, so in Northbeam, we'll get a, a, a even ROAS for say Facebook and TikTok, but Snapchat will be one hundredth of that. And, we're, and in the platform of Snapchat, we're getting a seven ROAS. Yeah. So it's just like, it's great to kind of iron out these tools that might not be working, that are they saying they are working, there's nuances to that, of course, but that's kind of how I'm using those tools at the moment. I'm not looking at them from an ad set budget optimization at this stage because um, Taylor Holiday has got some really good quotes on Twitter about this, so go check it out. But he talks about how these tools aren't actually feeding data back to Facebook, so therefore you're making optimization decisions that won't be the same the next day. Um, so I'm not using them currently from an ad set. I am checking it just kind of seeing how off it actually is. Because um, in some sense, you know, Facebook should just be doing this stuff themselves. So um, I think, aside from that, 
we use kind of like a multiplier approach. So where, you know, the a, a 1.5, say, rise in Facebook ad account um, might be, you know, a three in the previous state. Yes. Now, over time, that's going to continually shift. So we are constantly kind of watching that and kind of using our own multipliers within the platforms and making sure our media buyers really do have a touch and a feel for what was what's currently, and then also what the output is of those channels. So we use what, what's called an MER, which is like a, a full funnel return on ad spend. We plot a graph in our dashboards, which is sales, and then we have an MER target. If you know our MER, MER goes too high, which is like, let's say 31%, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll pull back Facebook as kind of like our main driver. Yes. Now that's problematic because while Facebook is like our primary driver, we're starting to get some really good results with TikTok. So TikTok is starting to really drive some traffic for us. So that can also move the um, sales and MER quite dramatically. This is where we're starting to get, this is starting to get a little bit more advanced and probably not for, for all your listeners. I probably wouldn't advise going ahead and doing this unless you're spending quite a bit on these platforms, but building platform specific ROAS targets within North Beam. So that's where we're getting to. Um, but right now we just really use an MER. We up optimize on very much on like ad carts um, cost as well um, from an ad set level to try to get the best decision. And then, you know, just hope and pray. <laughs> Not actually. <laughs> and like, what else are you doing? Like, I'm just genuinely curious because it sounds like you guys have been really, really strong on paid advertising. It sounds like you still are, but you know, like for example, um, do you know Rob from Quadlock, another Melbourne yep. guy, big e-commerce brand. Um, you know, for those guys, it was really funny. I We interviewed him, I oh, interviewed him like three years ago mm -hmm. and he was saying like, I'm going to move into retail. Mm -hmm. And so he said, like when we caught up, he said, oh, Nathan, it's so funny. Somebody watched the interview that you and I did three years ago and they're like, Rob, you were right. Mm -hmm. Retail's where it's at now. Like, are you guys going hard on retail? Are you doing more on influencers? Are you going harder on TikTok influence? Like, yeah, talk to us kind yeah. of like, what are you doing to combat this stuff? Because it's easy to see from the outside, you know, you're super successful. You've got a nine figure uh, portfolio of brands or one nine figure brand. Like it's really impressive, but what are you doing at this kind of level to kind of, you know, cause, cause this will continue to happen, right? Like platforms come, platforms go. Like one of my mentors, he, you know, he was doing one one cent clicks with Google Ads mm -hmm. ten years ago. Founded right. co-founded co Big Commerce, right? Uh -huh. When when they were playing against Shopify, right? That platform, you're not getting one cent clicks. Yeah, you know, it's a dollar, two dollars, right? So platforms come, platforms go. I'm just curious, like what what is what are, what are you doing? What are you how are you approaching this? Yeah, I think um, I totally agree with the retail and wholesale approach. The because I think you know we. We say we're direct to consumer e-commerce brands. I think that that's pigeoning us as, you know, we're brands. Like mm -hmm. we need to think that way. We need to think that, um, you know, we can be in all of these retailers and stuff like that. The reason why I didn't in Australia early is because we were moving so much and this might not be the right approach in hindsight, but there wasn't many retailers that could move enough to kind of make it worth in Australia. In the US and these other places where they've got you know, Walmart, Target, um, all of these massive retailers, they, they um, it really does make sense. And it's, I think looking at it now, it's all about focus for us. Like where previously I wanted to focus on creating a ton of these brands and because that's what the landscape was allowing me to do. Yes. That digital was easy. I was in a coronavirus period where I can launch kind of any product and it would scale like crazy. Granted, we could still probably could do that but I don't think it's the best use of our time and capital. I think the UDI, we're really refining what the brand actually is as a first step, getting all of our levers and workflows sorted within our existing business core business, because I don't think we've done that yet. You know, one thing that's maybe different to a lot of other brands is we went global really quickly. Like we tried to get the market, you know, we kind of own the market in UK. There are some people growing there. Um, we we're slow in the US, but we we're probably biggest in Canada as well. Um, Europe, we, we can grow quite dramatically there. 
if we were to kind of then put our resources into like retail or wholesale here, that might just not be the best opportunity or best area for focus for us right now. But I'm very much in favor of the, the strategy because I think it's just a good, providing you can maintain the customer experience. I think it's just good to be able to give the customers your product in their medium that they want it. You know, whether that's Amazon, you gotta make sure the financials make sense, but if they're in the store and they see your product and they already wanted your product, that's just a good customer experience. So um, yeah, definitely in favor for it. So I would say, to answer your question, what else am I doing? We're just getting that sorted. Um, dealing with the volatility of the market right now. We're not over leveraging ourselves with inventory to facilitate that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll probably look at retail wholesale next year. Yes. What market that is, I'm not sure. It might be Australia, might not. But we're also, I'm putting a lot of resources into making the UDI the, the biggest clothing um, comfort wear brand in the world. So we want to you know, really own that lounge pajama space globally. Yes. Um, you know, there's other big players that are doing clothing that really rely on their tech and their AI, like Shein and stuff like that. You know, that's that investment in that rapid testing framework, how does that fit into the retail strategy? And the retail strategy is very much more downstream. Um, finding these products is more important, what I've been talking about, and that goes down to a skew level of clothing as well. So I really want to get that nailed and then we, we'll go to the retail wholesale. Mm. I'm curious, like the Udi sounds like it's just such a behemoth. Have you ever considered just cutting everything else and just going all in on the Udi? Look, it's a good question. I think I think I had investors that were, you know, wouldn't come in because I wasn't diversified enough. And that really played in my head that what I should be doing is getting diversified. My answer for that was to build all these brands, some that didn't work. Um, which in hindsight was a really bad capital allocation decision. Um, I, I actually talked to some other people recently and they're like, you're too spread thin. And it's just like, they're always, people are always gonna poke holes in that. Mm -hmm. But to, to answer your question, I don't think I would enjoy that. I think I really do enjoy launching lots of stuff and trying new things and learning stuff. Like I, I, I love the other brands as well. So really from a capital allocation, return on investment point of view, yes, it should just be Udi all in. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that that's as fun as it could be. I really want to build like a fun brand. We just launched a boucle range that's selling really well. Just about to launch a fleece range as well, doing lots of licensed collaborations and stuff like that. So it's just, it's just good fun. Yeah, no, I respect that, man, because um, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Like, you know, it's about having fun and, uh, you know, the highs are high and the lows are low, right? Like, uh, but... Um, no, it's obviously something you consider. I just had to ask you. So um, we have to work towards wrapping up. I'm, I'm conscious of your time as well. And like, uh, you know, this is an awesome conversation, man. I could talk to you all day. Um, you're selling a product every 10 seconds. I'm curious around the machine that you have to support that around what does your team look like? Can you talk us through that? You said you restructured things. You now have one person not working on multiple brands, which is kind of, you know, economies of scale play, which, yeah. So, so talk to us about that, how the team is structured. Yeah. So the smaller brands, I think smaller brands really should run lean. And that's the beauty of e-commerce. You can run a small with kind of like one brand manager that's either generally marketing focused, um, and then you probably need a counterbalance of customer service and ops. Yeah. And that can be a small, that can scale, you know, three, four million dollars, just that team. You can yeah. use agencies, as much as you want scale up, scale down. Um, the bigger brand, um, you know, we will share finance and HR to those smaller brands just because it's a very um, scalable kind of resource. Honestly, when a brand hits a certain size, I'd definitely get a fractional CFO and fractional bookkeeper and, and separate it as quickly as possible, but they can't support that at this point. The, um, the, the team, you know, we have CMO, uh, COO, CFO, and then underneath, I'm not sure if this is going to get too technical, but we do have like a head of content, um, a head of e-commerce, which is handles merchandising. Everything goes on the website, handles developers. Um, we also have, uh, what else have we got under that team? We've got like a head of creative who handles a lot of that. They're the kind of the custodian of the brand, managing that side of things. Um, we've also got uh, you know, obviously our media buyers, we've got a uh, head of retention, which is kind of like our email marketing people. 
Um, yeah, and then under ops, we've got a, a, a big team underneath that that handle forecasting, all of those kind of elements. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's getting too granular. No, that's cool. Um, and that team is split between Melbourne and Adelaide. It is, yeah. Yeah, so customer service, we've we've got a lot in Adelaide. We've also got a lot of our content creation over in Adelaide. That's yep. just how it happened. Um, and then we've got, uh, yeah, a, a lot of our, two of our C-level people here, a lot of our ops team here as well. Yep. And do you, so you often fly your leadership team to Adelaide or you guys are moving in between? We do fly our leadership team over to Melbourne. So yep. we've got more leadership team here and we do, you know, our strategy days here, which is really, really good. Um, I think the main thing with remote work is to build uh, a certain cadence of meetings and all the key things really need to be structured in a weekly meeting where you, you tick everything off, um, you know, cameras on to ensure that culture, but then also nurturing it in different ways is, is really, really important. It's been a bit of a challenge, but we're definitely learning how to do it. Yeah, got you. And then um, I have a lot of respect that you're still building the business out of Adelaide when you're like, you know, t- talent, you know, there's, there's not as much talent in Adelaide, right? It'd be usually in the Melbourne or Sydney. Um, why is that? Is that a lifestyle choice, family choice? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think as there's a lot of value in it. As you mentioned before, Toby Pierce from Sweat um, did it as well. There, there's huge, it's especially when you're struggling to find someone for a role, it's amazing to be able to post in two regions. Mm. If you've got the full remote set up, it's so, so good because you can compare candidates. We have not, you know, picked or choose from if someone was better in Adelaide, would hire them in Adelaide. That's just how their splits ended up. Um, granted, a lot of uh, recent roles have been in Melbourne, but our Adelaide team is, you know, top um, top class as well. They're, they're incredible. So it's just kind of how it fell. Obviously, if you can't afford, you know, two offices, it's not the best go. It's not the leanest structure, but, you know, our people are kind of everything and the reason why we've been so successful. So it, it's worked out well. Yeah, awesome. And um, you as a leader, right? Like, what are you, 26, 27? 27. Um, you know, you've got a, a senior leadership team, C-suite leaders. Um, what are you doing to develop as a leader and... Uh, yeah, moving into like this true CEO role, actually quite fast mm-hmm. from how fast your business businesses have grown. That yeah. must be a big change. It's been it's been the most unnatural thing um, that I've done to this point. You know, both from me being less hands on, which is just against my nature, but also you know just how much you have to learn and how there's no actual there's. I've read a lot of books on becoming a CEO and listened to a lot of successful CEOs on on podcasts and it's just so variable across, you know, what your role needs to be, what your team is, where your company is at, is it in wartime, is it peacetime? It's just so, so difficult. It's definitely something like as a huge introvert, I re- really do struggle with. Um, and it is it is really my main thing that I'm just trying to learn how to lead and um, how to structure organizations like through OKRs and encourage your C-level suite and stuff like that. It's, it's really, really unnatural and challenging, all I'd say, is um, you know treat people with respect and and just keep learning and ask for feedback you know constant feedback from the people your direct reports are and even other people as well get a coach so yeah that's kind of all I'm doing for it awesome and you have a coach so you coach yeah yeah yep. I've got a coach I've got coaches in kind of a lot of elements of my life like different parts and and not just formalized coaches you know they're just mentors that that help me out. Oh, I'd love to hear. Kind of, could you? Would you be able to share? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, look, it's not not hugely detailed. I, I have a coach in in Adelaide. He um, more uh, more from the business side of things. So, a very uh, white collar kind of upbringing. Yes. Um, he's also like a psychiatrist as well. Um, so he helps a lot of people. So he's got that real ability to kind of bring the best out of yourself, as well as like you can talk about it, lots of things. You know, it's incredibly traumatic and stressful thing running a business you're dealing with a lot of other people um so it's great to have someone that's incredibly mindful rather than this is results 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 because you've got to look after yourself as you know so he was incredibly helpful um i also think that getting a formalized mentorship and that could be in a form of a board as well um that you need to report to some accountability was really beneficial so that's what i'm kind of setting up now hopefully toby pierce will help me out and 
that, that kind of form. So yeah. Oh, awesome. So you're setting up a board. Uh, I, won't, I probably won't set up a formal board, but I'm trying to get more formalized mentorship and like a bit more accountability um, for me and my C-level suite. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, look, um, we're going to move to the hot seat round. Got a couple of questions for you and then we'll work to wrapping up. Um, if you could go back to your first day in business and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be and why? Enjoy the process because it, you know, that's that's 90% of the battle and it's just, yeah, you've got to enjoy it as well because you'll look back and you'll, you'll wish you enjoyed it more. What's the hottest product niche to be selling in right now? Oh, God, they're all good. The one with the most contribution margin that everyone's talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Elon Musk. He, he just couldn't go past it. I hate to be boring, but he's amazing. Yep. And the last one, what's one thing you've learned today? Mm, that you should book f flights with long stopovers because I got stuck in Byron Bay coming here. <laughs> that's not a problem. Yeah, that's not a problem, exactly. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, look, Davey, thank you so much for your time, man. And actually just being so open, honest, vulnerable and humble. Congratulations on all your success thus far. I look forward to watching your journey. And it's great to connect. Thanks so much, mate. Appreciate it. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.